this series um, on, uh, or we'll be starting a series on Hope Thou in God, and we'll be looking at a lot of different things, reasons for hoping, how to hope, how do you apply the biblical principle. Uh, the one we're starting this week, and I don't know exactly how long it will run, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I call uh, this the, uh, the Bible and series, and if you'll look in the front of your uh, bulletin, it talks about that. Um, we're having tonight, Bill Daigle will be presenting the life of D.L. Moody in multimedia. You'll really enjoy that. And the, the Sunday night series that I've been doing is, uh, remember the old TV show, This Is Your Life? And they brought the person in, brought people in that he knew all through his life and all that. Well, I, I'm calling this one, um, This Could Be Your Life. And what we have looked at so far, I preached to you on the protected life, the unshakable life, the fruitful life, the directed life. And next Sunday night, uh, I will be speaking on the dedicated life. What do we mean by that? And how does it differ from the way most people live? Uh, Central Baptist Church Youth Fest coming up October 9th. If you're interested, if you've got some young people that would like to go, contact Elise. And the new series that I'm starting this morning is called The Bible And. So today I'm going to be preaching to you on the Bible and panic attacks. Okay? Now, down the road, there'll be several other things that I will be touching on. And this is not necessarily the order in which you will receive them. Uh, this morning, panic attacks. But then I want to talk about medical care. Some people have the idea that if you believe, if you have enough faith, you don't have to go to doctors. You know, you just uh, trust God. He knows more about your body than doctors do. So, you know, you don't have to go to doctors. Don't believe those guys. They don't know what they're talking about and that, and that sort of thing. And then I want to do a, um, one on sodomy. And I want to touch on lesbianism and homosexuality and a rising thing called transgenderism. If you were here Sunday night, Tom Stiles says that uh, the Cuomo and his group want to force churches and religious groups to require accepting transgender um, uh, activities uh, in the church and also uh, having a bathroom where anybody can go to. If a kid wakes up one morning and says, I'm female, and he happens to be male, he can still go in the, you know, the, the female bathroom. And then I want to do one on gambling. I'm amazed at how many Christians buy scratch-offs and play lotto. And uh, so I want to I want to preach on that. Am I hoeing too close to corn? <laughs> okay. Then I want to do one on the Bible and riches. People have the idea that you know that if you're a Christian, you can't make money, you can't have money, and I, the Bible never says stuff like that. And then I want to do one on marriage and divorce. The Bible and marriage and divorce. We'll talk about that. Those are a lot of things that are in the news today, and. Uh, Hopefully it will be helpful to you. I promise not to bring a baseball bat and beat anybody. Either. But I do want to tell you what the Bible says. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. If you're trying to locate there. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. When you get to the book of Jeremiah, go to the 17th chapter. I want to read verses 5 through 8. You probably will wonder, what in the world does Jeremiah have to do with anxiety? Well, um, I think anxiety started in the Garden of Eden when God came walking in the evening and Adam and Eve decided to hide behind a tree. So <clears throat> anxiety was already there. And anxiety has been a problem for people ever since. Uh, the uh, medical profession and psychiatrists and psychologists are making big money on what's called panic attacks. Okay? Jeremiah 17, beginning in verse 5. Um, Judah had sinned, and God was about to pronounce judgment on him. And this is what he says in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and uh, shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful or anxious in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding. Two pictures are before us in these verses. One is a picture of a person destroyed by anxiety. And the other is a picture of a person over whom anxiety has absolutely no control whatsoever. So 
So notice the cause of anxiety is given. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. That's a misdirected faith. Uh, cursed be the man that maketh flesh his arm. That's misdirected resource. And cursed be the man that departeth from the Lord. That's misdirected loyalty. So when I was at EMS, I spent 28 years at EMS and the last 16 years at the paramedic level. And I was often called to the home of a person who supposedly was having what the dispatcher called a panic attack. Our medical protocols gave us plans for treating panic attacks. Now, personally, I avoid the term panic attack. I prefer the term surrender control. <laughs> I never went to a panic attack call at the home of a dedicated Christian. None of my patients were trusting God. None of my patients were drawing on God's strength. None of my patients were loyal to God and to His Word. So the term panic attack, I think, best fits the biblical concept of being anxious. And the most common biblical words uh, that we find in the Bible related to the idea of panicking are the words careful or distressed. Now the word careful, if you know anything at all about linguistics and about the origin of the English language, you know that the word care is a combination of two words, care and full. And careful of the 17th century meant full of anxiety because the word care meant anxiety. It didn't mean, like we say today, be careful when you drive somewhere. We mean be cautious. The word cautious and careful are really not synonyms. So the biblical concept of careful meant full of care, full of fear, full of anxiety. That's what it meant. In Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, we're told, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. He shall not be careful, that is, full of anxiety in the year of drought. Uh, in Luke 10, 41, Jesus rebuked Martha. Remember the story? He came to the home. Martha was in the kitchen getting everything ready and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. And uh, Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. The word careful there is interesting. Greek word, merimnao. It means fragmented, pulled apart, distracted, anxious, translated taking thought sometimes. And then notice that it's linked to the Greek word trouble. And this word for trouble is the word turbazo. Our English word would be turbid. You ever been close to a waterfall and you see the water pounding down there and it's just bubbling and boiling and stirred up and all of that. And the word came to mean, uh, turbid came to mean disturbed, troubled, stirred up, confused. And in Philippians, Paul was writing, get this name, he's writing from death row advising Christians on how to face the uncertainties of life. <laughs> so he writes from death row, and he says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. And what he's saying there is don't be anxious about anything. Don't have anxiety over anything. Now, sure, Caesar's got me in prison here. Sure, Caesar's going to cut off my head. Sure, I won't see you anymore, but I'm not going to be anxious about that. Would you be willing to say that? <laughs> so this is important because what happens if we believe otherwise, then it militates against the modern medical and psychological concept of a panic attack. Let me tell you what medicine says a panic attack is. Medicine says that it is a being overwhelmed by a depressing emotion. Now the word panic attack, when I use the term panic attack, I feel that I'm under attack by some strong emotion outside that just is going along saying, there's somebody I can attack, and it jumps right on me, you know, and there I am. I'm a victim of some pressure which causes me to be anxious. Well, let's take, what is the biblical concept? The biblical concept is that I am totally responsible for choosing my response to everything that happens in my life, regardless of how severe it might be. That's why Paul could write from a prison on death row, facing execution, and say, hey, don't be anxious about anything. Rejoice in the Lord. God's going to provide all of our needs. You see, an anxious response is disobedience to a command in the Word of God. You ever thought of that? Distress, another word, originally meant to tighten or to restrict. 
to take broad areas and make them narrow and confining. Different words are used in both the Old and New Testament. An Old Testament word translated as stress is the, the uh, Hebrew word sarah, which means to tighten, it means to cause anguish, it means to restrict or make narrow, to afflict, to trouble, and to distress. Jacob said in Genesis 35, 2 through 8, that God had answered him in the day of his distress when he felt confined, he felt tightened up, he felt narrowed, he felt hemmed in of what was happening. Joseph's brothers, when they had sold him into slavery and he rose to power in Egypt, realized one day that that was the man they had betrayed, that was the, the brother they had been disloyal to, and they came to him and asked him uh, not to not to cause them any anguish or to cause them any distress. Use the Hebrew word sarah. And then David praised God in 1 Kings 129 for delivering him from all my distresses. Sarah in the Hebrew. Well, there are a lot of other Old Testament Hebrew references to that word, but it always indicates anguish, distress, trouble, adversity, or anxiety. Now, in the New Testament, there are words associated with anxiety. In Luke 21, 25, when Christ returns to the earth, he tells his disciples, what, what shall be the end of the age and what shall be the signs of your coming? And they're referring not to the rapture. They didn't even know about it. They're referring to his coming at the end to establish his kingdom. He said, there will be upon the earth the distress of nations. And Jesus uses the word in the Greek, sonoke, which means anxiety, anguish, pain, distress. In Romans 8.35, Paul affirms that the true believer cannot be separated from the love of Christ. Remember, he lists all those things, and one of them is distress, and it's a different word. It's a variation, stenochorea. It means to, to make something narrow and restricted, to press in from sides, to create a calamity, to cause anguish or distress or anxiety. And then 1 Corinthians 7, 25 and 26, and 1 Thessalonians 3, 7, Paul uses the same Greek word anagke, which means to be constrained, to be held back, to be distressed, to become anxious. Well, if we put all of those words together related to panic or anxiety, we observe the following sensations associated with it. Pressure placed on you to do something. A sense of being hemmed in and unable to move. Feeling of being overwhelmed by or having limited options to act. Now medical science and psychologists tell us panic attacks are real. And some people suffer what has been called panic disorder. Now what is the protocols for the Mountain Lakes region that I was executive over for a number of years? What do our protocols say are the symptoms of a panic attack. Number one, difficulty breathing. Difficulty breathing. <clears throat> Number two, chest tightness. Maybe even chest pain. Chest tightness. Maybe pain. Number three, wanting to avoid places or people. I was sitting in the back of the ambulance with a woman that supposedly was having a panic attack and I said, uh, your daughter out here wants to know if she can ride in. I don't want to see anybody. Don't let anybody ride. I don't want to see anybody. I said, okay. Said, okay, can you see me? Am I okay? But <laughs> and uh, then number four, phobic avoidance. Just fearful of just about everything and trying to avoid anything. Another one, uh, number five, is agoraphobia, which means becoming paralyzed about public places and encountering people. So one, difficulty breathing. Two, chest tightness, maybe even pain. Three, wanting to avoid places or people. Four, phobic avoidance. Five, agoraphobia, which is a paralyzing fear of going out in public. And then six, nausea, lightheadedness, and sweating. So the problem is multifaceted. And that's what our protocols say we have to treat. Now, <clears throat> I couldn't tell a person, because I'm operating under medical protocol, I couldn't tell a person, oh, you're not having a panic attack. <laughs> you just lost control of yourself under great pressure. And I couldn't say that to them. So what I had to do is I had to treat them. 
best way to treat is put oxygen on them and say, okay, now take a breath and hold it. Don't breathe again until I tell you to. Five seconds, take a breath. Five more seconds, take a breath, and I get them to slow their breathing down, and suddenly all the symptoms vanish. They're on oxygen, they slow. What happens when a panic attack and respiration increase, you blow off CO2, and what happens is it changes the pH balance, and that's what causes the lightheadedness, the nausea, and all that uh, in the body. Well, <clears throat> let me give you some points here about this multifaceted problem. First of all, the Bible tells us to avoid panic attacks. It, it's a command. God tells you, don't have a panic attack. Well, it doesn't say that in the passage. No, but it says be careful for nothing. And the Bible doesn't say don't smoke cigarettes either, but it's got enough principles in there to tell you not to do it, right? So avoid panic attacks. The Bible said be careful for nothing. Uh, it means don't be anxious about anything. Psychology and medicine imply that the panic attacks comes upon the unsuspecting victim. You had nothing to do with it. You were just sitting around having a good time and suddenly panic attacked you, you know? It implies that the victim has no responsibility to control the attack. So, number one, the Bible tells us to avoid panic attacks. Secondly, the so-called professionals reject <coughs> the Bible. And that removes personal responsibility from handling properly uh, provoking situations. So if a medical doctor tells you, well, bless your heart, you're just having a panic attack, and uh, let me give you some medication to help you with this, okay? So then you wander around in the fog from the medication, and the panic attack's gone, but you can't think or do anything else, you know? Uh, and then they make, it also gives the impression that only a humanistically trained medical professional can help you. And for years, psychologists, psychiatrists, and medical professionals have been stealing from the church the right to advise people on life-changing issues. Well, there really is no need to have panic attacks, and particularly if you are a professing Christian, you've been born again, you have no reason to have a panic attack. Well, you just don't know all the problems in our faith. I don't need to. God does. Why should I need to know what God does? God knows what you're facing. God knows. I'll tell you something that will really shake you up. You ready for this one? God knows the worst possible thing that could happen in your life and when it's going to happen. You don't. Know, but he does. He knows that. So let me give you some pointers on how to avoid having a panic attack. There's 75 of them, so get your pen out. <laughs> Not 75. My dad used to say one of the good things about hitting your thumb with a hammer is whenever it quits hurting. <laughs> so now that you know there are 75 and there are only a few, then you're, you know, I can handle that. Number one. This is, the, this is the real power of them here, okay? Decide not to be anxious. Now, I'll be the first to admit to you that I often fail with that one, okay? <laughs> but it's still the right thing to do, whether I fail with it or not. So I tell you, I had something come up the other day, and I said, Lord, I am not going to be anxious. And then while I was telling him that, I felt... I felt the tension rising. You ever that? I said, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be. And the more I said it, the better I felt. And I turned out not to be anxious. But I wanted to be. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. And that phrase, take no thought for your life, the same word translated anxiety. Don't be anxious for your life. So right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus deals with anxiety and its causes. But remember, this is the command now. Take no thought. In other words, don't be anxious. A command mandates a choice. You either obey or disobey a command. Take no thought. It's the imperative of that little word we were talking about earlier, marimna. To be anxious about something. To be distracted. To be fragmented. Pulled apart. To be unsettled. Paul commanded the Philippians from his spot on death row in Rome, be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. And he used the same word, marimna. Philippians 4, 6. So, number one, how to avoid a panic attack. Decide not to be anxious. Number two, direct when you have a problem. Direct your attention to God's promises, not the problem. 
A lot of people have the idea that books are nice, the Bible's a nice book to have on the shelf as long as you don't have to read and apply it. <laughs> okay? There's a tendency to be anxious when some problem presents itself. And I tell you, I have had enough problems in my life to know what it means to be anxious, okay? But the problem may take many forms. Uh, Matthew 6, Jesus talks about being anxious about preserving your life, being anxious about what you have to eat, being anxious what you have to drink, being anxious about the condition of your body, being anxious over the clothes that you wear. And any threat to these areas has the potential of producing anxiety. If you go to the sixth chapter of Matthew, sixth chapter of Matthew, and you look down at verse 26, and here's what Jesus says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Are you not much better than they? God cares for birds, which are less valuable than you are. So why wouldn't you think that he cares for you? Uh, God cares whenever I have trouble with a car. God cares whenever I've gotten a bad report from the doctor. God cares when I've had a difficult week on the job. God, God is concerned about everything that troubles us. And the Apostle Paul learned that he could trust God to meet every basic need. Writing once again now, writing once again from death row in Rome to the church at Philippi, he said in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You avoid anxiety by taking your eyes off the problems and by focusing on God's promises. Now, I don't mean ignore problems because they, they have to be solved. But the more you focus on the problem, the more you're going to be engulfed by the problem. The more you focus on God's promises, the more you're going to be equipped to deal with the problem. So how can I avoid panic attacks? Well, number one, decide not to be anxious. Number two, direct your attention to God's promises. Number three, determine the causes of panic attacks. If you know what causes of panic attacks, you're going to be better able to analyze what's happening in your life and deal with it. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 25, and uh, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, that little segment carries with it, it is fraught with principles that can help you understand what causes anxiety. So let's look at it. Number one, misconception about life. Is not the life more than meat in the body than raiment? Verse 25. The word for life is the common word, suke, means the life principle, the spirit, the soul, the heart of man. It refers to the life principle. Many people spend their entire lives with limited focus. They get up, they have breakfast, they go to work, they come home, they have supper, and they go out to some toy, play with some toy. They do the same thing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on Saturday they try to 
fill their lives with enough pleasure to forget about all they had to deal with during the week. And most people spend 50, 60, 70 years of life doing exactly that. <clears throat> you threaten any one of those areas that they have to be involved in and they're thrown into anxiety and then they will turn around and follow the psychological uh, direction and say, I'm having a panic attack. So misconception about life. Life is more than the habits that we have to keep ourselves physically alive. That's the whole point of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. Number two, another prompter of anxiety is a distorted sense of self-worth. Jesus talks about the fowls of the air, verse 26, lilies of the field, verse 28. And he said, look, if God's concerned about that, don't you think he's concerned about you? You're far better. I mean, one sparrow falls to the ground, he knows about it. We have value to God. Uh, to me, one of the strongest statements in the entire Bible of what God thinks about us is found in John 3.16. There's a difference between being a sinner and being worthless. A sinner is a person who has been judged by the law of God and found guilty and needs a redeemer. That doesn't make him worthless because God was willing to send his only son to die on the cross for one person. So we're not worthless even though we sin. So Romans 5 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we're valuable to God. And therefore, because of that, we have no reason to panic. He's in control. He's operating for our best interest. That doesn't always appear that way. You have to take that by faith. So anxiety is caused by misconception about life. Number two, distorted sense of our own self-worth. Three, trying to change what we cannot change. Trying to change what we cannot change. Jesus said no one could add one cubit to his stature. I used to think that referred to height, but I looked up the word stature and did a, an analysis of it. It's a Greek word. It's not, not used frequently. It's a helikia. And it can mean stature. It can mean height. But it also is applied to the process of maturing from immaturity to maturity and also the age or the length of life. So you and I are genetically duplicated at birth. We cannot change our height. We cannot change anything about our fit. Well, I know people that go to the doctor and they get their nose done and they get the face lifted. Yeah, you can do things like that. But you can't really change you. You can't do that. So when a day passes, we cannot relive one second of the previous day. There's no power on earth that can live one second of a previous 24-hour period. We cannot alter any evil thing that we did to hurt somebody else a previous day. We might go and seek repentance and forgiveness and uh, seek to reestablish a relationship. We can't change it. We can't change it. See, trying to change what we cannot change can prompt anxiety and panic attacks. The Bible says our times are in God's hands. There's no diet you can get on that can lengthen your life. It may help you to enjoy the life that you have better, you know, but it, you can't lengthen it. Another prompter of anxiety, number four, lack of faith in God's care. Verse 6, or verse 28 of chapter 6, says Solomon in all of his glory could not array himself like God does the lilies of the field. Jesus asked, if God clothes the lilies like that, can't he care for you, O ye of little faith? Verse 30. You see, those who can't trust God to care for them are highly susceptible to situations which can prompt anxiety. The closer you are to the Lord, the more intensely you are involved in His Word, the more you communicate with Him regularly, the less likely you are to suffer panic attacks. We used to sing years ago when I was growing up a little chorus, he careth for you, He careth for you. In sunshine or shadow, He careth for you. Well, another cause of anxiety, number five, seeking contentment the way the world does. Seeking contentment the way the world does. 
verse 32 of that passage we read, Jesus said, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. It's the way the world operates. Success is, in the world is, is, is accumulation of wealth, accumulation of things, accumulation of land, rising in popularity and power. I remember when I was growing up, my mom and dad both owned businesses. My mother, just prior to her salvation, had closed a deal on purchasing the largest um, dry cleaning and laundry company in the entire state of Florida. So once that deal would have gone through, she had signed a contract uh, for millions of dollars. That deal had gone through, then she'd probably been one of the wealthiest women in Florida. And uh, she and dad got saved six months prior to that. And the day before she was supposed to sign that contract, she died of a cerebral hemorrhage taken to the hospital. I remember coming back on my bicycle, watching the ambulance pull away, and hearing the pastor try to tell me, you know, God is in control. And I rebelled against that for almost six months before I got saved. But, you know, the world collects stuff. My granddad told me, he said, if you don't go to that little dinky college up in Chattanooga, and you go to the University of Florida, I'll pay all your tuition, buy you a house off campus and buy you a car and you study to be a doctor or a lawyer. My dad says, and yeah, I'll, I'll help with the whole thing. Whatever you do, don't go to that little dinky college up there in Chattanooga. Don't go up there and study the Bible and plan to spend the rest of your life doing that. Come down here, your mother's estate, my estate, he said, we're talking about millions, we're talking about businesses. Get your business degree if you want to and run these and you'll be a millionaire. Have you ever noticed that the ungodly want to bribe the godly? <laughs> yeah, that's a, the world collects stuff. The world seeks material wealth. The world chose its own way. Rejecting accountability to God, the world pursues its own aims with concern for now, but no concern for eternity. The world provides no genuine satisfaction. All it can promise you is temporary pleasure. Once the pleasure is gone, you got to start looking for a new pleasure. Anxiety is caused by seeking contentment the way the world offers contentment. Well, there's another cause of anxiety. I call it misplaced priorities, having misplaced priorities. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So what has priority in your life is really what is most important to you. You see, there are some people that claim to be Christians and they say, well, I believe the Bible and I believe in God and, and I believe in prayer and all of this. But they only read their Bible occasionally. They only go to church infrequently. They only give a little money to the Lord because that would cut into what they want to buy their toys with. And they only pray when they're in trouble. They don't treat the Lord as a personal friend that they talk to all through the day. They are not seeking the kingdom of God first. You see, if your priorities are wrong, then your life's patterns will be wrong. And if your life's patterns are wrong, you will always be promoting and pursuing what's wrong. The result, you'll be easily frustrated any time what you've been putting in first place is threatened. The only thing you can put in first place that will never be threatened by any power on earth even when powers on earth think they're threatening it, is seeking first the kingdom of God. That can never be threatened. Well, there's another cause of anxiety, number seven, and this is the last one. If you're under as much conviction as I am, you're probably glad this is the last one, right? <laughs> I call this uh, cause of anxiety trying to live in tomorrow today. Jesus said in verse 34, take no thought for the morrow. And actually, don't be anxious about tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow is what hadn't happened yet, right? And he's, <laughs> he said, sufficient under the day is the evil era. Or as one translation says, every day has enough trouble of its own. So why would we be asking for trouble from the next day? <laughs> take no thought. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. You see, focusing on what might happen tomorrow distracts from seeking solutions to the problems of today. 
focusing on what might happen tomorrow distracts from seeking solutions to the problems of today. Sufficient unto the day is evil. There it is. Years ago, right after I was saved, a teenage girl used to sing in our church. She wasn't really a great singer, but I'd love to hear her sing this song. And uh, her life backed it up. And she would be asked by the pastor periodically to sing it. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. For today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. She came from a very troubled background, a lot of difficulties, reared by a single mother back in those days, 1950s. Yeah, but principles, when put into practice every day, will allow you to rest daily on God's promises. So don't borrow from tomorrow's frustrations while you're trying to avoid anxiety today with the Bible and panic attacks. Let's stand for prayer. Father, thank you for your guidance in our lives. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us answers to life's problems even if we tend to ignore them. And we pray that you'd help us to be smart enough to believe that you know more about how we should live than we do. Help us to realize that the Word of God gives us direction and that it's up to us to apply that direction. We ask you as we open the altar to speak to our hearts whatever our needs might be today. In Jesus' name, amen. 489. All your anxiety.
to help us out tonight, we need some uh, finger foods. Uh, uh, you, maybe you've got something you do like banana bread or something like that as well, if you want to bring something like that, or cookies, that's good. But uh, any finger foods, some small sandwiches, something like that will help. After, I've invited unsaved people to be here tonight. After the presentation by Bill Daigle on the life of Moody, we gather in the um, cafe back there and have time of uh, uh, socializing, getting together, and uh, eating. That sound good? So it'll help us out, bring something if you will, and uh, we appreciate your helping us out with that. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart, and uh, love that soul through me, and then Paul lead us in prayer, please. <coughs> Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. Thank you. 